there. It is April 4th, 2021, which has no greater religious or sacred attribute to it as does yesterday or tomorrow. And yet every day we recognize that our old man is dead because Christ died for our sins. Amen. And we walk in newness of life because Christ rose from the dead. And so we who are Christians, because we know the will of God and what he's accomplished through his death and resurrection, walk every day by his death and resurrection. And if that's not something that you, you practice, then that's something I'd exhort you to do. It's not just something we believe and say, yes, that's part of my belief folder. It's something that we operate and walk by, his death and resurrection. We live in newness of life because of what he's done. And so that's what's important, uh, more than a day. This week, the lesson is called, This is the Will of God. And I want to address, as we deal with these basic issues in Christianity, uh, this issue of God's will, because this is huge, folks. This issue is a major topic for many Christians, for many people, is knowing God's will, understanding God's will, finding God's will out. And I want to deal with that today, hopefully in, in, in part, uh, to give us some understanding of what it is. I think this is one of the major issues of concern for the church. It's one of the, the greatest benefits of being able to rightly divide your Bible. The greatest, of course, is having a clear testimony of salvation, understanding the gospel clearly. But following that is this idea of understanding the Bible, which is to say to understand what God wants. What is He doing? What is His purpose? The will of God. Uh, when we study the Bible dispensationally, really what we're trying to figure out is not just drawing lines on a chart, but what is God's will? How has it been progressively revealed or not? What is He saying and doing in this dispensation or at any time? that he wants us to respond to. What, what, how is God intervening in this world? What is God's will? And this is something that people naturally seek out, but Christians also look for this to know what they should do. They become Christian, they get saved, hopefully by the gospel of the grace of God, which is the only way to be saved, by Christ's death and resurrection for your sins and your justification, the complete work done for you, as we covered last week. And then they get saved and they want to know what to do now. Now, for some who might say, well, since he did it all, there's nothing we do. And that is incorrect. Okay? The, the, he did it all to save you. He did it all to make you who you are. But God has a purpose. God has a will that we're a part of now, that we're saved by God's grace and put into Christ. And so what is that will? And where is that found in the scripture? Christians are historically, at least in, in my generation and before, uh, like to talk about the journey that Christians are on. Right? We're all on this journey, the big journey. And it's now accepted that believers must be on a constant journey to discover God's will. If I ask you, are you uh, how is your journey discovering God's will going, which is not language you've ever heard me use in conversation with you, but if that's uh, what one Christian would say to another, uh, to say, well, I'm not on a journey to discover God's will, would seem to be that you're lacking something as a Christian. You're lacking zeal, motivation, passion. You don't really love the Lord. I'm just not on a journey to discover God's will. You know, wow, well, maybe, maybe he'll speak to your heart. Maybe I can excite you with uh, you know, some fire to get you on this journey. As if this is what Christians should be doing on this lifelong journey to discover the will of God for your life. And uh, that really, as we'll see in this lesson, is not the Christian life, the Christian walk. It's not what God would have us do. But people do this, and they're looking to discover God's will because they don't know it, which that would be logical. We don't know it. We should try to find it out. You definitely should be concerned with knowing God's will. If you're, you don't want to know anything about it because you don't care, that is a problem. That's a heart problem. But the folks I'm talking about today, maybe you in the past and me in the past, where you want to know. You're sincere, you want to know, you want to do it, and so you're trying to discover it. Where do you look then for a direction? Where do you look? And uh, this is one reason why the Christian church at large, in America at least, is so, uh, uh, it's, it's so many factions, there's so many diversions, there's so many directions that Christian churches have because they don't all agree on this thing, the will of God. They don't know what God is supposed to be doing. And so they're doing different things. This is why in the last 20 or 30 years it's been trendy for pastors to cast visions, which is not even Christian at all. This is Eastern religion, New Age information, that sort of thing. But casting a vision for your church. Well, why do they need a vision? Because we need to know where we're going. Well, isn't every church got the same mission from the Lord? But that's the issue, the will of God. What's the will of God for our church? What's the will of God for you? What's the will of God for you? What's the will of God for me? And who knows what God has in store for each of us, right? Well, the Bible does, Amen. right? And, and we as Christians ought to know. Uh, it's not to say that once you're saved, you automatically know, but it's been revealed. But where do people look? It's taken for granted that God has not told us. 
others try to seek the places where God has spoken, namely His Word, and they give this up as too confusing. I mean, I need a seminary degree. I don't understand it. Uh, it's not really talking about things relevant to the 21st century. So set that aside. It's confusing, right? They've been told that the Bible can't be understood by them, right? Well, let the experts study the Scripture. Um, leave that to us. Well, if I can't find it in the Scripture, where am I supposed to look? And they're going to look within themselves or without the Scripture, without themselves, inside or outside. It's the only other places to look uh, if, if you're not looking at God's revelation. And so the heart's desires, you've heard this before. Uh, how do I know God's will? Well, what's your heart desire? What has He put on your heart? You heard that before? Yeah. What has God put on your heart? Oh, okay, well, let me think about what's on my heart today. In Psalms 21, the Bible talks something about this. If you're looking for biblical justification or proof texting, I can give you some of those. You've heard them many before. Psalm 21, 2 is an example of this. Thou hast given him his heart's desire. And I was talking about the Lord. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation. How greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him his heart's desire, and hast not withholden the request of his lips. Now, of course, this is talking about the king of Israel, walking according to a covenant, not in the sensation, but this is all declaring the end from the beginning. But someone who doesn't know how to rightly divide, doesn't, isn't learning to study context, and is told all the Bible is for you, they're opening Psalm 21 saying, God gives us the desires of our hearts. What's on your heart? This is what God intends to give you. Right? Uh, look at Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So God must be in the heart desire fulfilling business. Right? What's God's will? Well, that's what God, God wants what we want. What a loving God. He loves me so much. He wants to give me what I always wanted. And this is taught, folks. This is a thing. Maybe you sympathize. I've heard it before. I was influenced by it before. Other people have been as well. Because we're looking for God's will. What is it? And how, what comfort it is or joy to think that God's will is what I've been wanting all along. Wow. I'm in line with it. I don't have to learn anything new. I don't have to do anything. I I, I, what I always wanted was what he wants for me. Of course, the Bible says other things about your heart. Look at Psalms chapter 10. Psalms 10 in verse 3. The wicked boasts of his heart's desire. Whoa, that's a shift. I thought God was giving us the desires of our hearts. The wicked boasts of his heart's desire and blesses the covetous. Like the people who want, 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 want. Oh, well, there were things I wanted. Is that wicked? Yeah, thou shalt not covet is a commandment. Mm, not one that people spend a lot of time on these days, it seems like. But It says in verse 3, The wicked boasts of his heart's desire, whom the Lord abhors. Wait a minute, I'm confused now. I thought God wanted to give me the desires of my heart. Psalm 10, 3. Well, see, the Bible can't be understood. Right? Confusing, which is it? I don't know. Confusing. So, I'm going to trust something. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. So what is it? Your heart's desire? Well, we can't work, look there. Let's look, maybe, maybe God's speaking to me another way. Not through my heart, I can't trust it. I don't know if it's God or not, really. When I think about it, the Bible's unclear about this. So I'm going to look outside of myself. The circumstances. Look at Judges chapter 6. You've heard of this before. Fleecing God. Or it's derivative, looking at the circumstances to know what God wants you to do. Right? Knowing God's will. Judges chapter 6 in verse 36. Here's Jeroboam, otherwise known as Gideon. Judges 6 verse 36. Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, I would underline, as thou hast said. Christians skip right over that. It's anything now that they want to fleece God for. But as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine own hands. Here's God's will. Be determined by Gideon's fleecing God, a circumstance that if this thing happens in this accordance, then it will tell me what God's will is. Can I teach that idea of God's will in the Bible? I can. And it has been. Henry Blackaby, among many others, I've written books and spoken and preached using the Bible to teach knowing God's will from either your heart or circumstances, right? 
He says, Then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand. And it was so, verse 38, for he rose up early in the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water, but it was dry on the ground around it, right? And Gideon said unto God, I mean, the, he got to thinking after this request and this fleece that, you know, I see that, that there's kind of a, a branch over the ground here. Maybe it was a coincidence. Verse 39, Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me. Um, I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with thy, the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let it be the dew. Another fleece. Because it could have been coincidence, right? God did so that night, so he did it again. For it was dry upon the fleece only. Well, now we've got two circumstantial evidences, right? It's God's will. I'd point out to you that before this fleecing, God told him. Yeah. Like, he said it. That should have been enough. I'd also point out that just to interpret Judges 6 from a mid sensational perspective, that the covenant allowed for such things by certain people. The covenant of God, whom God promised signs to his people in the covenant, back in Deuteronomy Leviticus, allowed for certain things such as this, so that Israel would know, right? You're not under the covenant. But that's, that's the product of right division, not the cause of it, right? You've got to understand how to, to use your Bible to, to understand that sort of thing. So you can see how it can be taught from this, God's will in the circumstances. Look at uh, Joshua 1, verse 8. You know the story in Joshua 1, verse 8, that if you meditate on the law, right, day and night, you'll be what? Joshua 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that, that, uh, uh, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. There's two things people take from this regarding God's will. This is a bookmark verse, folks. Right? You've had some maybe on a t-shirt or something, I don't know. Uh, they skip over the law part. The book of the law, that's just a figure referring to the Bible. Law, Bible, same thing. That's what they do. Um, but it shall not depart out of thy mouth. So you meditate on it, and if you do what the Bible says to do, then God will bless you. This is one conclusion people take from it. Again, Joshua is under the covenant given to Israel, so that allowed for that. But secondly, they'll say, I can judge whether I'm doing what the Bible says to do based upon my success and prosperity. So there's those two kind of twofold aspect to it. And you, you all know this, shaking your hands, because this is how maybe you thought and how it's definitely taught by the majority of Christians how to know the will of God. Because we definitely can't know by hearing the words of God. We've got to know by looking at the circumstances or the desires of our hearts or maybe fleecing them every now and then, testing the waters out, right? And so circumstances. Now, it's interesting. Here it says, if you do the things the Bible says to do, you'll be prosperous and successful. In Judges 6, you have Gideon, who was faithful according to this covenant. He asked God a request, and God fulfilled it, which gave him evidence that, of God's will. Um, look at Job. Job, the great thorn in the side of the evangelical Christian who um, is looking for God's will in the circumstances. Right? So, if this is the teaching, we learn God's will from the circumstances, then what about Job? There's an entire book here dedicated to a man who was upright and lost everything. Now, true, in the end, he had more, and that's how it's taught. Yes, everything got taken away, but God had a purpose for his life and planned to multiply him. His children died. He lost his, his family, his, his riches. Job 1, verse 10. And it's not simply a coincidence here this has occurred. This is what's troubling about Job. Hast thou, uh, here's Satan talking to the Lord. Satan and the Lord are having a conversation about this man. Okay. And it says, Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house? This is where the idea of a hedge of protection comes from. God has hedged a protection, a protective hedge around you. Job 1, verse 10. Uh, and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, Satan, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord, with permission of the Lord, to take things away from Job that he received by his upright obedience to God. This is a dilemma. So how then can you fleece God? How can you look at the circumstances and say, well, I know God's will? Could Job? Could Job say, look at my circumstances. I must be doing something wrong. 
That is precisely what his friends said. And later God rebuked his friends. Said they don't know what they're talking about. Right? Job didn't do that because he knew better. Uh, look at Job chapter 31. Something you got to know about Job. If Gideon heard God speak to him, I'm not talking about that inner voice in your head, like God actually sent an angel to speak to him, visually and verbally. And if uh, Joshua there knew what God said according to the law, there seems to be a common theme here. God will tell you, like he'll speak to you in words what he wants you to do. And Job, Job's issue is that God didn't tell him anything about this. In Job 31, 35, and Job's response is right in that he does not blame God or credit God for what's happening. He's, he's simply going, I don't know what's happening. And that's a good response. Right? If God hasn't told you what's happening, you should not surmise that you know. You should stay in the realm of I don't know. His friends wanted to surmise. Well, it looks like you know, God curses the wicked, Job, so you must have done something wrong. It must have changed. Your behavior must have changed from before to now because God's blessing has changed. They're trying to interpret something from the circumstances. Job in Job 31 in verse 35 says, Oh, that one would hear me. And by the one he means the Lord here. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. The adversary here is God who seems to be against him. He says, I would that mine adversary had written a book. Job is commonly, uh, it's the earliest book of the Bible, meaning not the events in it are the earliest. Genesis would take that title, of course, the beginning of the creation. But Job is a book that was written before the law books to Israel, right? And so it was bef before, the earliest uh, a man before Israel. And so there was not a Bible that was compiled for Job, right? And he said, I would that my adversary had written a book to explain what's happening. He would have revealed his will. That's very interesting. Verse 36 says, Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. Job's uh, orientation is around what God has said. He says, I wish God would speak to me. Now, God ends up doing that. And that helps Job a lot. It always helps when God speaks to us, right? The question is, how does God speak to us? Is it through your heart's desires? Through the circumstances? Or is it through his words? There's that option. When people discount the Bible and say we can't understand it, you're discounting the words of God and you're looking for God's will every other place, which is the wrong place to look. But this is where Christians default to. Circumstances. When they come to circumstances, though, and they can't figure out good or bad, I mean, it seems like I've been doing things better in my life with the Lord and trying to obey Him and do things that are right, making good choices, and I'm still getting bad consequences. The admonition by Christian, to Christians is this. Well, just trust God with the outcome, right? with the end. It'll all work out in the end, right? This is the us idea that they're told. Because you can't, you don't know, apparently, you're confused by your heart's desire and circumstances, and you can't control it anyway. It's God's power, right? It's His will. So just trust God with the outcome. He will direct your steps. You've heard that, right? Now, all of this is biblical language. I'm trying to show you that even though in its ignorance of God's will, there's biblical usage here. It's just not dispensational. Christians are blind to what God's will is. God will direct your steps. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You've heard, if in all thy ways you acknowledge him, he shall direct your paths. Right? So here, it's not about you intervening in the circumstances or looking, reading the signs or anything like this. It's, it's just acknowledging him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So you trust in the Lord. Lean not to what you understand or don't understand. I don't understand what God is doing. This is the cry of many a Christian, right? So what's the verse say? We'll just acknowledge him and trust him and he'll direct your past. What an assuring verse. Okay, well, if I don't understand what he's doing, I guess I'll just trust him and I'll acknowledge him. He's still my Lord and God and, and, and my path is going to be what he wants me to walk in. What does this lead to? I'm going to blindly take a leap of faith I'm going to take a step on a path, because as long as I acknowledge him while I'm taking that step, he will direct it. Right? So you have blind people walking around, yeah. trusting God for an outcome. He'll put me in the destination he wants me to put me in. It's up to him now, because I don't know what to do. You've been in that position? I don't know what to do. And I don't know what God wants me to do, so I'm just going to take a step. God must want me to do that. 
The lie that we tell ourselves is that the step that you just took is God, a step that God wants you to take. When he didn't tell you that, but the verse seems to indicate he'll direct your paths. I don't know what to do, I don't know where I'm going, I'm taking a step, I'm going to say that's God. Right? What have we just done? We've made what we do God's will. Right? And that's the greatest lie in the Bible, folks. Your will being God's will. What did Jesus say? Not my will, but thy will be done. Right? So it's like, that's a big problem. But this is what the deception is. And so God directing steps. Fate. Calvinism, right? If he intended for them to be saved, they would be saved. If he intended for you to do that, it'll happen. Right? How? God had purposed it for the world began. Right? He has a wonderful plan for your life. I heard this on the radio just the other day. I can't listen to Christian radio for very long. I try to just to, to hear the news and what's going on and just to hear the verbiage that people are using now and where, what's going on in the Christian circles. But at the end of the, the, the program, and don't forget, God has a wonderful plan for your life. If you'd like to learn more, send us your tax-free deductible. Like, okay. um, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 is where this comes from. And unless you are a Jew... Living in Babylon against your will, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, doesn't really apply to you. <laughs> Speak of which, you have to be a Jew living in Babylon for 70 years against your will. Because when Jews went there at the beginning, it still didn't apply to them. They're waiting for the end of their deliverance. Jeremiah 29 is dealing with God, it's the same subject in Isaiah that we're studying. Uh, Israel being taken captive by the Babylonians, according to God's prophecy. And, uh, and they, they're taken captive there. Daniel was part of that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of that. And uh, he said, he'll, you'll be there for 70 years. After 70 years, I'll bring you back. Right? So Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, the thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. The NIV is always the version that people use in this passage because it talks about a plan that God has and your future. It uses the word plan and future. If you're looking for God's will for your life, Jeremiah 29 11 in the NIV is a pretty good place to go. Except that it's out of context, not talking about you. And the verse says, in verse 11, I know the thoughts I think towards you, not I have a plan for you. Right? And the thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end, not I have plans for a future for you. The expected end is the end of the captivity, and he's going to bring them back. And the thoughts that he has are the same thoughts he's had towards Israel since the covenant was given to Abraham. So this is all known information here. Right? People read that, however, and they read it as if it's unknown information. God has a wonderful plan. We just don't know about it yet. I need to be on this journey of discovery. Right? He is actually telling them what his thoughts are in this chapter. I will bring you back in 70 years. Right? Well, people don't want that because that doesn't apply to them, obviously. But the plan for my future, that's what I want, and he just hasn't told me yet. You ever had a prophet come up to you and tell you God's plan for your future? That's an experience. Especially when you're going, what? Who are you? Yeah, you ask that question, who are you? Well, God gave me the gift of prophecy. Oh. You know, and then what comes out of the mouth is nothing about what God is doing today. You're going, hmm. It does sound complimentary to you, however. Oh, yeah. I, I've not heard, and maybe you've had this experience, because it seems like it'd be consistent with the Bible, that uh, a prophet comes up to you and says, I know God's future for you. You will go through suffering, pain, and loss. <laughs> I've not heard that. Maybe that's happened to you at some point. But this is consistent. The Bible actually has had this happen. Paul had that happen to him. Someone came up to him and said, you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be put in chains. End of story. See you later. You know. <laughs> oh, I thought God had a wonderful plan for my life. <laughs> that's not what was told to Paul. Of course, Romans 8, 28, you know, the passage used out of context there in Romans 8, this, we're getting Pauline now, where all things work together for good. End of verse, right? No... <laughs> All things are so this is trusting God with the outcome, right? I don't know what God's will is. I don't understand it, but I don't have to according to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I just have to trust Him and acknowledge His ways. And God has a wonderful plan for my life. And all things work together for good anyway. And so I should really be at peace with this not knowing. Right? It doesn't help you making choices, but as we've already covered, the choices you make, if they're God's choices for you, then you know, what's the difference? Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good. Continue reading. To them that love God. I love God a lot. Loving God and not knowing what he's doing seem to be contradictory. Yeah. To say I love my wife and not know what she's doing, that's neglect. 
well, we have a, a kind of love where we don't have to know about each other. That's interesting. That's an interesting definition of love, right? Yeah, I love someone and I never talk to them. I don't know what they want, what they, I don't even know who, what their middle name is, but I love. That's a lie, right? I love God, what's he doing? I don't know. What's his plan for you? He keeps it a secret. That's the kind of relationship we have. He keeps secrets from me, right? Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> Romans 8, 28, to them that love God, that's not the whole verse. The verse says, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So, you see the according to his purpose there? God has a purpose. Now, this sounds like Jeremiah 29, 11, doesn't it? He has a plan for us. Paul is talking in Romans 1 through 8 about the purpose of God. Just like Jeremiah, he is explaining what the thoughts are. Romans, Romans is about God's purpose and salvation of you. Reading Romans gives you God's purpose. So to take this verse out without reading Romans 1 through 8, you're missing the purpose part. They work together for good, and then they're called according to his purpose. If you don't know what the purpose is, you don't know what the good is. And so you have Christians ignorant of God's will, not able to understand his will, not able to trust the Bible because it seems to be contradictory in its statements about where to find it, right? Who just trust that God has a wonderful plan for my life, and are taking steps, calling it God's will. This is not a good situation. And we wonder why our country is declining in faith. Okay? Well, it's because of atheists. Atheists make up at the most 3 to 4% of our country. Christians, even in the declining numbers, are attending church today in higher numbers today because of Easter, right? But in the declining numbers, 40, 50% of Christians go to church. You say, well, that's down from 70%. 50% of people are in church. 4% atheists. Why? Is there a problem? Maybe the people going to church don't know what they're doing there. Don't know what God is doing in them. Don't know how to live according to his will because they don't know his purpose. And I, at least I trust God to direct my path. But what path is that? I don't know. At least I trust God to always work, good, work out for good according to his purpose. What's his purpose? I don't know. This is not a good message. Just, just looking at the message, it's not, it's not right either. It's just not good. So here we are, here people are, and they're looking for direction, looking for God to communicate truth to them. And they come to church, and they say, well, just, how's your journey going? My journey of looking for truth? Well, I came here to church, I'm trying to find it. Yeah. Oh, well, we don't know it either. Look in your heart. Look at the circumstances. Maybe test the waters a bit. Trust God, and the steps you make will be His. Why do I need to come to church? That's why the numbers go down. You see, the problem we have in our country is not that the truth doesn't work, it's that people don't know it. Christians, churches don't communicate it. They don't know the truth of the will of God. Ask the average Christian, what is the will of God, and see what they respond. Now, some of them will be so audacious to think that God has given them a will that is outside the Scripture. God has called me to, and then listen to what they say, and most often it's not something in the Bible. They say, well, so what? God gave me this vision and dream, right? He called me to thus and so. You know how many times that's ended in failure? Like, that's not talked about. God knows this. How many times that's occurred where people say, God's called me to this, and the struggle. I've gotten communication from pastors who ask me, if I stop preaching because I don't want to do that anymore, am I going against God's calling for my life? And it's like, you think God called you individually to be a preacher, and now you're struggling because now that you don't want to do that anymore, what's that mean? And this is a frequent occurrence. If God called me before, and so there's a justification. Well, maybe God only called me for a certain time. He didn't tell me the time limit. Maybe, maybe he did. And that's why my heart doesn't desire it anymore. You see, they're spinning things. You're making things up. This, this is how Christians operate. Why is the church failing? Right? They have no direction. They don't know God's will. They can't understand their Bible. We've already established that. I mean, they use Bible verses, but they can't quite understand it. So when a contradiction is pointed out, they're going, ah, I guess we just grab one, a better one, because that's more comforting. Right? This is the problem. The Bible isn't weak. God's word is not weak. But when it doesn't work in people, it has no effect. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. It has to work effectually in those that believe who hear the word of God. Right? 
Matthew 16, 21, a wonderful plan for your life. That's what Jesus was communicating in Matthew 6, 20, 16, 21, right? Matthew 16, 21, when he began to tell his disciples, from that time forth began Jesus. Now, he began to tell them here halfway through his ministry. It seems like if he were communicating the same message that he communicates through the church today, at least he should be, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel, the preaching of the cross of Christ. If that's what Jesus was teaching, he should have began his ministry with that. Halfway through, he began to tell his disciples. This wasn't something he tried out on the masses. How that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things for the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Glory to God, he is risen. That there's the gospel. But he wasn't telling anyone that but his disciples. And when he told them, they didn't understand it. I know that's God's will. Was God's will to die for our sins and raise from the dead? Yeah, it was. You're correct. But they didn't understand it. He began to tell them this. And that is God's wonderful plan for Jesus. Go to earth, right? And in a few years, Jesus only lived a few years, uh, you will die. <laughs> this is like he's, dying, he's on the cross. This is my, God's wonderful plan for me. That's not how it's normally presented. Peter took him and began to rebuke him because he knew that God had a wonderful plan for this man's life, if not for his life. I mean, he's a fisherman, but this man is the son of God. God has a wonderful plan for him. He says, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Don't believe the lie. Trust the Lord, acknowledge him in all your ways, and he'll direct your path. He has a plan in the future for you. He says, no, i got to die. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter was trying to help. Peter wasn't being discouraging, having negative thoughts and comments. He was trying to be positive. He's like trusting the Lord, right? Like the Father, God, you know. And Jesus calls him Satan. And so when I get in a Pentecostal magazine that says how you know God is speaking to you is because the words will be encouraging and uplifting, I'm going, that is a lie. Right? And you'll know it's the devil because it'll be discouraging and negative. Like that's a lie. A lie against what I know to be the word of God coming from people who are trying to communicate how to know God's will. See, it's so ingrained in Christian culture now. It's just accepted that Christians are on a constant journey to discover God's will that will never be known to you completely, but God has it and he's keeping it and you'll find out one day in heaven, you'll look back and say, look at that quilt God sewn for us. You've heard the messages, right? But you're in ignorance. You live in ignorance. Faith equals ignorance. That's the Christian message. Who wants that? That's why numbers decline, Right? Who wants that? Here's my message today. I've got a half hour explaining the current state of, situ of the situation. And you all sympathize and you're saying, you know what this is the message communicated. We all were part of this culture when we also were in ignorance. Faith is not ignorance. It's not blind. It's not empty. It's not saying God is a secret. We don't know what it is. We've got to trust him for it. God has spoken through the people in this book. The prophets that wrote this book, he inspired this book. These are his words. If you want to know what God said, you open this book and you read and you study. And there's an issue there. It's not enough just to open the book. You've got to be dispensational about it. You've got to know how to use the book. You've got to understand the book, which is why we talk about the Bible rightly divided. The whole point of that is just simply to understand what God is saying to whom he's saying it so that you can understand his will. That's the point, Right? Taking blind steps toward your own ends is not faith, and it's not God's will. Just make that your understanding here, okay? Well, I want to do something for the Lord. Do not take steps blindly and call it God's will. It's not, and it's not an act of faith. If you don't know, it's not an act of faith. Faith is the knowledge, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that's not empty. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You hear the words in the scripture here. And it's with that knowledge that you can take an action. Yeah. If you don't know, I'd be leery of taking a step. Right? It's a leap of faith. Throw that out of your vocabulary, folks. We don't leap in faith. Right? Our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's in heaven. Okay? By the way, he wants you here right now. Like, I mean, on earth. He's in heaven. He wants you here. If he didn't want you here, you wouldn't be here. Right? You can know God's will. This is the message today. The message how this is the will of God. I haven't got there yet, right? But you can know it. That's what I need to tell you first. You can know it. The motive to seek God's will seems to be wanting to know how to live. Right? Um, but for whom 
should you be living? The idea of seeking God's will often and asking God in prayer for His will often has the, the motivation for many people of like asking a divine career counselor. Like, I don't know what choice to make, where to live, who to marry, what to do in, in my life personally. And so I'm going to seek the divine counselor for his advice. As if God is there to help you on your journey of life, whatever you desire it to be, whatever it is. Uh, that is not the idea of knowing God's will. God's will is not your will. You're not to live for yourself. You're supposed to live for God. That is the general theme throughout the Bible. You're supposed not to live for yourself, but to live for God. 2 Corinthians 5.15 talks about this in this dispensation where it says, the love of Christ constrains us. Yeah. Right? It constrains us. That those which live shall not live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We do not live unto ourselves. What's God's will for my life? Well, maybe your life isn't really the issue. Okay, you need to learn how to live God's life, His purpose, right? How do I fit in His will, not how can He help me with mine? That's the motive. So first you've got to check that motive there, right? So it's not how do I live my own, maybe God can help me understand my life. No, maybe God can help you understand His. That should be the desire, okay? And if not, then that's the heart check, right? That's... To use the evangelical language, that's where you've got to figure that out. Philippians 2.21, Paul says that's not an easy thing. And so you, you can't lightly skip over that. Because Paul says there's not many that desire that. Many people, when I preach this message about knowing the will of God and tell you what it is, they'll go, oh, sigh, I knew that already. That's not what I'm looking for. Exactly. Because you're not looking for God's will. You're looking for your own and for God to help you with yours. And that's wicked. Okay? Yeah. But Philippians 2, this is what Paul communicates. Philippians 2.21. And by the way, I say that's wicked, but no, we've all been there. That's flesh. There's none righteous. <laughs> I've been there. It's like, I want to do that, and I really wish God would justify my wanting to do that. Yeah. Or could help me in some way do that. Well, God isn't concerned with that. He has his own purpose and will. And so I have to change my orientation to want to do what he wants. Right? Well, Philippians 2.21. How to do that switch, by the way, is the whole issue. The cross of Christ helps with that greatly because... He doing the completed work to save you and giving all spiritual blessings to you solves your spiritual problem, your life problem. And so this response of gratitude ought to be that constraint that says, I should live for him. Philippians 2.21. For all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ. There's no man like mine who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ. You see? Paul's ministry, he's talking about that. All seek their own. It's true of us people in the flesh. Right? We seek our own. So deal with that. You've got to know that before you can know God's will. You have to be looking for it. Okay? Not looking for your own will to be justified. But God's will is His purpose, not our purpose. It's what He is doing. Not what God can do to help you do what you're doing. This is that, this is that idea. The Bible, the Holy Scripture, the Holy Writ here, is God's words. And the Bible states the will of God concerning you clearly. And I put that in quotes because that's a verbatim quote from the Bible. Twice. This is the will of God concerning you. You want to know what it is? The Bible says it. It says it clearly. You've got to first look at the Bible to know what God wants and His purpose, looking for His, not your own. you also got to know how to use the Bible because this is where right division comes in. If you're going anywhere in the Scripture, grabbing any verse you want, this is a problem. Because God does different things through history and Scripture. Right? And so this is this idea of needing to understand how to use it. Understanding the Bible is key to understanding the will of God. Dispensational Bible study is Bible study of the will of God and how it has changed or not through the Bible. Right? If you're not dispensational, you think the entire Bible is God's will for you. That's a problem. Right? As we've seen already, I've given you contradictory verses. So we have to put things in their context. You have to understand how to use the Bible. And that's the key to knowing God's will for you. And we say, where, where do you find your doctrine, your instructions? We're saying, where do you find God's will for you in the Bible? That's what we're saying. Right? Do you find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Do you find it in Deuteronomy and the Psalms? Where do you find it? And why? Right? And so we learn about how Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, that the mystery of God's will has been made known unto us. In Colossians 1, how he says, uh, it was given to him, the dispensation of, of God, Fulfill the word of God and how the manifold wisdom of God is now known through this, mis this mystery is now revealed. Right? So Paul uses this language. So that's not a bad place to start. Not the least of which is that Paul is the last person to whom Christ appeared and revealed what he wanted to do. Not a bad place to start. 
the last thing Jesus said, right? So it, it's helpful to go from Genesis up to that point to know how God has gotten there. Not understanding God's will, then, if this is where you're at, and all of us start there, don't think that you're, you're unique because you don't know and everyone else does. No, no, not many people know, and you, we all had to learn it, okay? Uh, in Ephesians 5, 17, if you don't understand God's will, it shows a lack of faith or a lack of wisdom. And so how can you say such a thing? It's such a bold thing. How can you say I don't have faith if I don't know the will of God? Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God contains the will of God. If you have not heard the will of God from the Word of God, how can you believe it? Right? I'm a believer. In what? Start with, what do you think God's will is? Well, start with the gospel. What is the will of God? Well, I don't know that. Well, how can you believe it? Right? You say you're a believer. What do you believe? Well, I trust Christ died for my sins and rose from the dead. Amen. That is the gospel you're saved. You can be saved and not know what God is doing, but you know this. God's saving people by his grace. Because you were saved, and God wants you to be saved, right? And so, you have to hear the word of God, whether it be in the gospel, whether it be in what his purpose is today, to believe that that is what's happening. If you don't know, you don't believe, no matter how much you want to believe. Someone emailed me and asked me this. They said, please tell me what I, what I believe. <laughs> I'm like, tell you what you believe. I can't. How, how do I do this? Now, they were intending to say, tell me what I should believe, maybe, uh, from the Bible, like what is true from the Scripture, what is God saying. That makes sense. But <laughs> tell you what you believe. But this is the idea among Christians, it seems like. I'm a believer. I, I go to church so they can tell me what I believe. <laughs> You don't believe anything yet until you know it, until you've heard it. You may want to believe. You may be seeking for the truth. And this is this journey and why it scares me half to death, because if people are on a constant journey to discover God's will, maybe they're unsaved. Maybe they're not really believers, though they want to be. And there's, as Rick Warren calls them, pre-believers. You know, well, if they're pre-believers, they're, they're not saved. They're pre-Christians is what he called them. Right? Pre-Christians are not Christian. Right? Oh, but they're on a journey to discover <laughs> On the journey, off the journey. They got to know the gospel, yeah. right? If you're going to do God's will, you got to know God's will. It means you got to hear it. Amen. If God never says it, there's no way any of us can know it. But if God has stated it and He says, This is the will of God, you should know it. Yeah. Then you can say, I know God's will. No more search, right? Stop searching for the will of God, is you know it, if indeed we can. Ephesians 5 17 says, Be not unwise. But understand the will of God, of the Lord is, what the will of the Lord is. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not unwise. What's that mean if you do not understand what the will of the Lord is? You're unwise. That's a negative thought. Yes, the Bible points out truth, which often hurts. And then it gives you the help, the solution, the salvation. You will never get to the salvation until you know the real problem. The Bible tells you the problem. We're born unwise. We're all unwise. There's none among us that can declare, I'm wise, not in yourself, you're not at all. Wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord, comes from the Scripture, from, from God's Word. That's where wisdom comes from. So if you don't understand the will of God, that's because you either have never heard it from the Bible. Or if you heard it and know it and don't intend to act or think according to it, that's just a wrong choice, folks. That's unwise. Right? I know God's will, just don't want to do it. That's not a wise choice. That's what unwise looks like. I know it and don't do it. That's just not lazy or, you know, I'm not zealous. That's like unwise. Christians have all sorts of euphemisms for sin. That's what it is. So either you've not heard it, thus you can't have faith because you haven't heard the, the Word of God, the will of God, or you know it and you don't do it. You don't act upon it. You don't think about it. You don't, it is, it's not a consideration to you. Be not unwise. Understand will the Lord is. Redeeming the time because the days are e evil is what he just got done saying. So this is significant. You can know God's will. This is how you get wisdom, how you get faith, is understanding the gospel, understanding the will of God, being a part of this. Most believers are believing lies about the will of God, which raises the thought in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Now you can be saved and struggle with knowing what you should do. You learn. You come to knowledge the truth. But if you don't know God's will even to save people, then how do you know that you're even saved? You don't become a Christian by just saying, I want to be. Right? You don't become a Christian or a believer just to say, because I want to. Nope. That's not how it works. You can want to and not be one. You got to know how to be one. Right? Your sin 
is going to be judged by God. You need a payment for the sin. Christ died for the sin as a payment, right? He rose from the dead to defeat death, which can declare for you eternal life. If you trust his finished work, he did everything necessary to save you, to give you eternal life, and made you complete in his, in his son, right? This is, you got to hear this to believe it. It's not hard after you hear it. It's just you got to hear it. Faith comes by hearing. You cannot say, I preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. It is necessary to use words to preach the gospel. Okay? Most believers believe lies about the God's will. So just to sum up these lies about the will of God, the lie that it's stated outside the Bible. God's will is not stated outside of this book. I'm waiting for God to give me some special revelation. Stop waiting. This is the special revelation. Right? Lie number two, you can do it without knowing it. Well, I don't know, understand God's will, but I've taken steps, and that's God's will. You can't do God's will without knowing it. Amen. Now, this is where people re react. They say, wait a minute. You know, there are lots of people doing good things. <sighs> now we've seen the problem, haven't we? You think God's will is simply doing good things. Right? There are people in their ignorance or unbelievers that do nice things, good things, even things that God at one point said, you know, don't lie, don't steal, honor your father and mother. They do these things. Is that God's will? People think that. The Bible just says God's will is to be obedient and to be righteous, and that's, that's God's will. That's, that's it. So if you do those things, then you're good. If you don't do the things, you're not. But if God's will is that all men be saved by hearing the gospel and come to a knowledge of the truth, if you don't know that, you can't do it. Right? So the people who say you can do it without knowing it are denying, ironically, the will of God, which is that you come to a knowledge of the truth. Right. Number three, the third lie they believe is that it cannot be grasped. God's will is something that cannot be grasped. It's beyond our understanding. God works in mysterious ways, and that's just how it is. There is a truth that there's things that man can't know about God and don't know about God because he hasn't revealed them. But the secret things are God's. The things that you need to know, which includes what God wants you to do in the Scripture, are knowable. They're known. They're, they're, that's why he spoke. He spoke to tell us things. Say God's will came. That's one of those things that we can never grasp is God's will. Normally that comes from Calvinistic mindset, normally, because the, 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 the system of, of Calvinism, the Reformed idea that God had predestined, elected everything that happened before the world began, they're essentially saying we can't know everything that had been elected and predestined. And, and if that system is correct, they're right. We can't know everything God ever predetermined. He hasn't told us everything he ever predetermined. The system's not right, however, and the Bible isn't talking about you knowing everything that ever will happen. It's talking about what God purposed to do and how you get included in that. The purpose of God in this world, right, is will for us. So that's a lie. It can be grasped. Number four, people think that it's a mystery. Maybe that hits home to you. I don't know. We preach the mystery of Christ. But we're not preaching the mystery of Christ as if it's still a mystery. It's revealed. So people who think that God's will is a mystery, that's a lie. It's not still a mystery. Now, I showed you already in Matthew 16 that the disciples didn't know about his death and resurrection. They didn't think that was the right thing, right? And there were people like Job who didn't understand what God was doing. So in the Bible, people didn't understand. There was a time where God's will, his manifold wisdom, was a mystery. So there's a biblical truth to that. But to think that it is now, it denies what the Scripture says now, that this is the will of God. And Ephesians 1.9, Paul says, the mystery of his will is made known. So you can't say it's still a mystery. It's now made known. Number five, this is a big one, worthy of another lesson sometime, is that God's will is to, for us to be happy, to make us happy. And this gets to the desires of your hearts and stuff, right? And this is where I become the bad guy. God's will is not summed up in the statement, he wants you to be happy. God is not purposing above all else to make you happy. <laughs> Why do I need God for it? Well, you don't need God, if your goal is just happiness and pleasure, you don't need God for that anyway, right? Go live in your sin and pleasure yourself, right? What you'll find out is that that's short-lived, it's vain, it's temporary, it's sinful, and it doesn't last forever, right? So, you see, it's not about making you happy. Christ wasn't preaching the gospel of happiness when he died on the cross. Paul doesn't preach the gospel of happiness when he's thrown in prison and chains, in Acts 9, 16, when Jesus speaks about Paul and says, I've called him in, uh, to, to suffer for my name's sake. That's not Jesus saying, I've got a happy plan for your life, Paul. I mean, you, you were doing a bad thing, persecuting me, and you had a rough life, but now, happiness coming. No, he said, now suffering's coming to Paul. 
Paul says the same thing to Timothy and to us. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to. There's suffering going on, right? Not all the time, not every day, not in every circumstance, but it's a thing. So God's ultimate purpose is not for us to be happy. His purpose is to save, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. The sixth lie, that it's unique to you. God's will is unique to me. Like, you may know God's will, Justin. Yeah, that's for you, but I don't know God's will for me. God's will is his will for all of us. And that only hurts if you think you're special. Right? Because would you rather not know his will and think it's unique to you, even though you don't know it, or to know God's will and to say it's all of our, his will for all of us? I mean, that's better, just right there. But secondly, God's will, as we read it, and it'll see it in the scriptures, is not talking with your name inserted there. Okay. And that's because it's his will, not yours. Right? It's unique to me. What is the will of God? Look at 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. We're going to read through the verses here to show where it's very clear in Paul's epistles, Paul being the apostle of the Gentiles, him being the one to whom the revelation of the mystery of Christ was given. Romans 16, 25, Ephesians 1, verse 9 and 10. Ephesians chapter 3, to the church about the body of Christ. That's you information. To Jew and Gentile, to everybody. And 1 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 3. He's talking about praying, make intercession and prayers and supplications for all men. Why? Verse 3, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who will? God, our Savior, who will have all men be saved. So, God's will, that all men be saved. At that point you're going, well, duh, you know, <laughs> of course. Well, th that's an important subject. Not everybody is, as we've discussed. There's many people who are searching for discovering God's will and don't know what salvation is or are unclear about the gospel. That's a big deal. Do you know what the gospel is? Do you know how salvation works for you? Do you know where you get it? Answer, in Christ, in his finished work. Right? But I can show you other gospels in the Bible. I can show you places in the Bible where they don't know about his finished work. So it can be confusing for people. God's will is that all men be saved, First Timothy 2, verse 4. Keep reading. His will is that all men come to a knowledge of the truth. You say, I'm saved already, so I've already done his will. Well, you didn't do that. Christ did it. But, okay, you're saved. Come to knowledge of the truth, that's something else. Like, the salvation is truth, but coming unto a knowledge and, and furtherance and growth and understanding his will, his purpose, who you are in Christ. Come to knowledge of the truth. The church is given as a pillar on the ground of the truth to speak the truth in love. We're to come to a knowledge of it so we can minister it. Because without ministering truth, people naturally believe lies. And the reason why the church is, is bound up with these lies about God's will is because they don't know the truth about God's will. So being saved is one thing, coming to knowledge of the truth is also the will of God. Right. Well, I don't want to offend someone. If you keep them in their lie, you're not doing the will of God. Right? He wants them to know the truth. He wants you to know the truth first. Ephesians 3, verse 9, look what Paul says here. What is this truth he would have people know? The gospel that saves would be the, uh, one thing, but there's many aspects to what God would have us know. You find in Paul's epistles much information and doctrine about God's wisdom and his purpose. Ephesians 3, verse 8, he, he sent Paul here, who is the least of all saints, and gave him grace that he should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's something you ought to know about. And to make all men see, so not just a few men, not just some men, all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God and created all things by Jesus Christ. That would seem to be something God wants to do if he sent an apostle to make all men see it. And Paul entrusts other faithful men to have men see it. If you can't be a deacon in 1 Timothy 3 without having knowledge of and confident in the mystery of the faith, it's important information, right? For growth, the fellowship of the mystery. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. There are two places in the Bible where it says very clearly, this is the will of God, and these are these two places in Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. Verse 2, he says, You know what commandments we gave you by the Lord? For this is the will of God. God has a purpose, a desire, he has a will, and that's what Paul commanded. Okay? That's what he instructed. Even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess your vessel 
in sanctification and honor. This is often avoided because fornication is a sin most often not talked about in the church anymore. Right? But you see how very clear this is. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, you should abstain from fornication. That's it. See, that's a small thing. I, uh, I haven't fornicated. You know what fornication is? Right? We'll deal with that here in a moment. But his will is stated very clearly there. Your sanctification. Look at chapter 5, verse 18. Now, I'm just showing you here the places where it very clearly says the will of God. This is the will of God. But there's many other things that in Paul's epistles that concern God's purpose. But you see how clearly it states these things. First Thessalonians 5, verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We saw it in chapter 4. Your sanctification, abstain from fornication. We see it here in everything give thanks. We see that all men be saved, come and knowledge the truth. We see to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. These are things very clearly stated as God's will. And if churches don't know where to find God's will in the Bible, have they not read these verses, or they just choose not to believe them? Lack of faith or unwise? One or the other. I don't know what it is. But it, both of them are bad. Right? And so we have clear statements here of what it is. This is the will of God concerning you. So stop searching. Stop looking. Stop saying, I'm on a journey. Stop the journey right now. You know what it is. Now your journey should be, your study should be, Knowing what this means for you. Like, how, how do I exercise this? How do I get active in what's happening here? How does this get performed? How does the will of God happen? My sanctification and everything, me giving thanks. That someone be saved, that I be saved, that I come to knowledge of the truth, that all men see the fellowship. How is that? What does that mean? But don't say you don't know it. He's told you what it is. Right? And these very clear statements. Now let's revisit these verses from this perspective of trying to now understand his will. We now know it. We can't say we don't know it. We can't say we're looking for it, waiting for it. It's a secret. It's a mystery. It's not. It's right there. It's been revealed. Okay? How do we understand this? Well, this is Bible study. This is our communication. This is our reading other passages around them. All men being saved. What does this mean? You got to know the gospel, don't you? The gospel of your salvation. So you're studying 1 Corinthians. You're studying Romans. Trying to learn what this gospel is. How can I be saved? You understand that's the question God wants us to ask. How can I be saved? Saved from what? That's a good question. Sin, Romans 3 teaches us, right? How? Through Christ's finished work, Romans 3, 4, and 5 teaches us. I mean, see, so you're learning about God's will. You know what it is, now you're trying to understand it in Romans. And you come to a point of faith and trust and belief in the gospel of your salvation. And Ephesians 1, 13 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Well, now you're learning that. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. You're learning this information. You know what it means also that all men be saved? It explains to you why God withholds judgment during this dispensation. If God's will today is that all men be saved, why, God, why aren't you judging that heretic and that evil, bird, wicked guy over there? And he's a, he's a murderer, and why, why aren't you judging him? All right? Why don't you put a stop to that? Why do bad things happen? Why does God allow evil in this world, is what the world says. All right? Because they don't know what God's doing. Why is he stopping evil? You know now what God's doing. What's he doing? Number one, he wants all men to be saved. All men to be saved. Yeah, surely not that wicked murderer over there. All men to be saved. That's why he doesn't stop the evil in this world. He wants their salvation. Now we've got a lot of big questions being answered simply by knowing the will of God that he stated so clearly in the scripture. Why do bad things happen? Now, that's something we can't answer. We don't know God's will. He has a purpose. He has a reason. He has an outcome. He's going to do something we don't know about. And, or he's trying that all men be saved. And if that be true then, and this is hard, but there's no sin that anybody can do that would inhibit God's will that all men be saved. Romans 5, verse 8, God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Is there some sin or sinner that's, extent, that's beyond the commendation of God's love? No. All men be saved. That's his will. Right? So see, now you know it, you start to consider and understand it. You're going, this has ramifications. And you see the ignorances in Christianity stem from not knowing simply what his will is. How can Christians not answer, why is God not judging evil? Why is he not removing evil? Why is there still evil? You should have, this is a very easy answer. He wants all men to be saved. And so he's giving grace to every sinner. Yeah, but that's beyond the pale. That guy, beyond what pale? God's grace? You see, that's, there's consequences there. Yeah. This also means that all men be saved, that you had to hear the gospel. You had to trust the message of yeah. salvation. How did you do that? Was it through a preacher? 
someone told you, you know, that, that's what I mean by not the ordained individual, but someone who's communicated it to you. Gospel tract, evangelist, something. You know what they had to do? Communicate it to you. That's called work. You can't be saved without work. The work of Christ is the message, but also the work of his body. And God ordained that to be. And that work's done by his spirit through people. But through people, you, you do work to communicate the message. You say, well, I, there was no person that told me I read it from the Bible. How do you think this Bible got produced? You say, God did it. You're right. He inspired it, preserved through the usefulness of believers in it. There's work done to print, to purchase, the ink, the paper. The words are from God, right? You see how that works? People say, the book was written by men. Yes, inspired by God. <laughs> there was work done for the book to deliver the message. Paul had to do the work. He said God's grace supplied me with the strength to do the work, but he had to do the work. And that work doesn't stop with Paul. Well, that's just Paul. Only he does the work. And then how does it continue? Right? All men be saved. There's a lot in that. What's God's will? That all men be saved. You've got to know what the gospel is, right? It tells us what God's doing in the dispensation to the unsaved and to the saved. We've got to set some system in place that we can actually do this thing. Like, participate, and then all, we got to get saved, Then other people should understand salvation. If that's where you left it, that's business, folks, right? That's, that's work. That's ministry, right? Doing God's will. And, of course, there's not a church that would deny that. They say, well, yeah, we, we want all men to be saved. What's the gospel then? This is a big contention about that, right? Watering it down, not communicating it clearly. Or doing things that don't save people at all. Or counting people saved that really aren't. Because they're believers. I'm on a journey to discover God's will. Oh, brother. They don't know yet. They don't know what it is. If they're looking for it, give it to them. That's just, help. That's just easier. <laughs> and that's the fear that they... That, that's not a fear. It's, it's the truth. The acknowledgement of the reality that many people who are in the church, the church in America are not saved. That's why they don't know God's will. Right? And so our ministry primarily in our situation now is to other people who are lovely, nice people who don't know because they haven't been told or they've read past it or don't know how to separate one from the other, so they're confused. And that's a major part of ministry. Right? And so you see people saved in churches. Right? They can be saved out of churches too. <laughs> but a lot of people are in churches. 50%. 50 you say that's down from 80. 50% is one in two. You're trying to talk to people who go to church for the most part, or that have gone at one point. Right. I raised in the church, I don't go anymore. They know what that's like. To know the truth, what does this mean? Know the truth about what? About God? About you? About his purpose? About his apostle? In 1 Timothy 2, you see where are you getting this information? From the context of 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2, Paul says, who will have all men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth? Verse 5, 4, there is one God. I mean, you understand something about God. The truth about God. There's one, right? And one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. That's also talking about God, right? So you got to understand this the, the, about God. You got to understand about man. He was also man. Who gave himself a ransom for all. Understand what he did. There's a lot of truth here, right? To be testified in due time. You got to understand when the due times were he testified things. There's some truth there, right? Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and apostle. Yet apparently, Paul's apostleship is significant in the due time of God's declaration of his ransom for all, which will help you know where to find God's will. Paul's saying, I'm the one to whom God declared this information as an apostle to you. So as he declares his will, you're trusting Paul because Christ gave it to him. He didn't invent it. He didn't make it up. It wasn't that he was the third or fourth hand, so I'm going to the source. It's Christ who gave it to him as an apostle. So there, there's truth here. Come to knowledge of the truth about what? About God, about Christ, about salvation, about you, you being a sinner, needing salvation, about where you find that in Paul's apostleship. Right? There's truth here. So there's a lot in that statement. How do you come to knowledge of the truth? You've got, you got to learn some stuff there. Right? And that truth, as it starts to work in you, is a significant thing. We talk about the fellowship of the mystery, Ephesians 3 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And we asked the question a couple years ago in our seminar, do you know what is the mystery? You may know that prophecy and mystery are different, but do you know what the mystery is? Because that's what we're trying to make all men see. 
and sometimes even right dividers. Uh, I, don't, I can't really explain that. I know the mystery and prophecy are different. Tithing's not for us. This is the mystery and prophecy. What's the mystery? Uh, Paul? Yeah, the, the, is it Jesus dying? What? They don't know what it is. This fellowship, this union we have with Christ, the way that we are connected to the Lord is this fellowship of the mystery. Because God had already revealed that there was a covenant with a nation, and that if you bless the nation, he'll bless you. But the way you have fellowship with Christ, this union was a mystery. So understanding the new creature, who you are in Christ, Colossians 127, this mystery among the Gentiles is Christ in you. Right? His resurrection wasn't a mystery. His death wasn't a mystery. It's Christ in you. It's a mystery. You see then, so his will is for you to know about this Christ living in you by the gospel. Going back to the thought of, are we trying to look for God's will or my will justified by God? You know, Well, this really puts an end to that thought, doesn't it? If God's will is that you know about Christ in you, so the life you live is not your own but Christ's, what does your will matter about anything? It doesn't. Well, I had a plan for my life. I thought it was God's. <laughs> no, God has a plan, and you need to figure out purpose is the right word. You figure out what that is, which is Christ in you, you get to know what that looks like. How do I live with Christ in me? So Ephesians 3.11 when Paul says to, or to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery, <clears throat> he says it's according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. So it's not just a trivial academic doctrinal point. This is the eternal purpose of God. How do I know God's will? This is the will of God concerning you. Right? Sanctification. Abstain from fornication is what the will of God says. Fornication is rebellion. That's what it is. Okay, that's what it is. God ordained man and woman in the flesh. You think of fornication as the sexual, as the physical, right? And there is that. But that, what is it? God ordained a man and a woman to be one in marriage. Anything not that is fornication, right? Premarital, extramarital, it's all fornication, right? Because when you get married, first of all, God made a woman, God made the man, and he made them to be one in marriage, and then in marriage, you are a husband, you are a wife. And so there's these things about who you are, right? Who am I? Can you see the confusion about the will of God in our culture today? They don't know who they are. People are saying, we don't know people's gender even when they're born. They don't know who, they don't even know the physical of who they are. I mean, that's the big problem. See Identity Crisis Seminar this last year, but God wants you to know who you are. And when you know the truth about who you are, who God made you to be, then to be anything but that is rebelling against who you are. Yeah. Fornication, destroy, it's soul destroying from the inside out because you're doing something that is not you. You understand? You're not a husband, you're not a wife, it's not you. And you're doing something that's not, that you're not a husband, why are you doing things that husbands do? You're not a wife, why are you doing things that wives do? Right? Or you are a husband and a wife and you're acting like you're not. Why are you treating that other woman, that other man, like, like you should be treating your wife? You're not doing that which God made you to be. Or to put it in a more spiritual sense, he made you in Christ, put you in the body of Christ, and you're acting like you're Israel. You're acting like someone you're not. It's rebellion against who God made you to be. It's what fornication is. It's not just the fleshly act, which is, I mean, there's consequences, but it's like, why is God so serious about that? Because he made a man, he made a woman, and made them to be one. And if you're not one with another, why are you acting like you're one with another? Right? In that way. If you are one with another, why are you acting like you're one with someone else? You see the issue? It's, it's you saying in rebellion, I'm going to act in discord according to who I am. That's why it's soul destroying. Because you don't know who you are. It's a co conflict you're creating. If you would just walk according to who you are, which means by God's grace, he's put you in his son, and you are now a member of his body. You're, so acting who you are, that's why there's no condemnation anymore in Romans 8. Paul says your sanctification, that's why he puts sanctification next to fornication. Christ sanctified you by his grace. It's not something you have to, to work and earn and deserve sanctification. You don't. He gave you sanctification by his grace. When you are saved and trust the gospel, you were set apart from being a sinner and sanctified, declared to be holy by Christ's righteousness and put into his body. That's now who you are. So why shouldn't we sin? Because it's not who I am. It's not because it's just wrong and if I sin that I can't be sanctified. No, you are sanctified by Christ. So he says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Christ gave you that. Abstain from fornication. If who you are is in Christ, why do you do things contrary to who you are? You see that? 
And so you see then walking contrary to that, sinning even, right? Thinking that your flesh is going to make you perfect, any of those things, those wrong doctrines, has an effect to destroy your soul from who Christ made you. Which is why Paul uses the terms of death in Romans 8. It's a problem. Same fornication. The lusts of your flesh, concupiscence, the desires of your heart. <laughs> it's no longer your heart, it's Christ's will, right? So why are you acting like it's your own? First Corinthians chapter 6, he deals with the Corinthians fornication issue and says, you were bought with a price, your life's not your own. Why are you acting like it is? That's fornication attitude and behavior, right? It's like, uh, it's not my life, I'm going to act like it is. Well, who in the world are you, right? Are you married? You're not married? You're one with another? You're not one? If you're one with Christ, why are you acting like you're not? Fornication, right? So there's more into that than meets the eye. Yeah, I haven't committed adultery or nothing. You know, I, well, there's that, which is important, but there's a reason why that's significant. It's the reason why you should honor your father and mother and you stone children if they don't in the Old Testament. Why is, why, why is that penalty there? Because the principle is significant. Honoring father and mother goes back to honoring God because they're where you came from. Right? So there's that. Paul, the Corinthians had this issue of fornication physically as a result of their spiritual lack of understanding. Right? That's why he deals with it in 1 Corinthians 3. Know you not, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Right? Chapter 4, stewards, it's required of stewards to be faithful. Chapter 5, it, it's been reported there's fornication among you, actual fornication, which Paul sees as a symptom of a bigger problem. Right? Chapter 6, he's talking about this idea that you have been sanctified in Christ. You have, you have been. So then why? Why are you doing those things? That's how Paul teaches it. The last will of God, as we seek to understand it, is to give thanks in everything. And everything give thanks. Well, yeah, I thank God for my food. You know, when I pray, I always thank God for what he's done. And that's all good. But what's that mean in everything? Why is that the will of God? Well, Romans 1 talks about how where it begins for you to separate yourself from God and his will and desires and everything else is your lack of thankfulness towards him. Romans 1 says they weren't thankful and they, God gave them up and over to a reprobate mind. That's where it all began, right? They had the garden, they had life, they had everything, but they didn't have it all? Wrong, right? That was the deception, that was the lie. And everything give thanks. Look at Colossians 3.15. If you're giving thanks in everything, you give thanks for things you've been given. And God's grace, he's given you things, which you should have come to a knowledge of. And what this is, is that in every situation and circumstance, you're grateful for what Christ has provided for you and done for you and given to you. That's grace. So if the message is grace, your response is thanks. And if you don't respond in the thanks, and he gives the grace, there's going to be an issue. The issue being, you get things and are ungrateful for them. Right? And don't think ingratitude doesn't have a consequence. It does. And I don't mean you're going to spend eternity in hell because now you're saved by God's grace. I mean, in knowing the will of God, living the will of God, walking in newness of life, right? Being who God made you to be. What's the motivation here behind this? The love of Christ constrains us. You know God's love, commended in Christ's finished work. Your response is constrained by gratitude. Right? It's what it is. It's not law. That's why Paul says there is no law. It's not the law says thou shalt. No, it says this is what I've done. And if you see that love given to you freely, if you've ever been loved in that way, your response is love back. Your response is thankfulness. Your response is, that's not even a, 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 I'm not even bound to do this, but I want to. Because you've given so much to me. Right? That's how grace operates. It changes your heart in response to what Christ has done. And so in everything, give thanks. Because you, you might forget. You tend to forget. We all forget what Christ has done, what he's given. And we think we need something for our little plan or something. Right? In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, you see where thanksgiving shows up in all these places in Paul's uh, communication of our ministry. Uh, for peace, for example. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, the which also you are called in the one body. Be ye thankful. And everything give thanks. Philippians 4 talks about praying with thanksgiving in your heart in the peace of God. Why should we be thankful? Peace. Knowing that you think you're lacking something. Well, actually, God tells us we're complete in Christ. See last week's lesson. 
To be thankful for that is to acknowledge that and to know the reality of it. Right? So for peace, for prayer, Colossians 4 verse 2 says continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. You don't continue in prayer and watch in the same with greediness and selfishness. Thanksgiving, right? So what happens if God doesn't answer your prayer? Well, you must be the lucky one that God answered the prayer for. Didn't answer it for me. Where's the thanksgiving here? God has given you sufficient grace, right? So in everything, everything give thanks in prayer. Continue in prayer and watch with thanksgiving. I'm not watching, well, I'll thank him once he answers it. What kind of selfish thing is that? He's already given you forgiveness, eternal life, justification, the Holy Spirit, all spiritual blessings. The unsearchable... I mean, the list goes on, and you're going, I'm waiting for this next thing. In Thanksgiving, continue on prayer, right? It helps for prayer, helps for peace, helps for stability. Colossians 2, verse 7 talks about being rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with Thanksgiving. Apparently, the way you've been taught is to be rooted in Christ with Thanksgiving because He's done the foundation work, He's done that. Your response? Thanksgiving. That's important. If the Thanksgiving's not there, how can you appreciate who Christ made you? How can you appreciate the task of God's will that needs to occur? You don't. And this is what I think happens. People are so discouraged by what they perceive as the guilt and burden of having to do things for God because they're not thankful. There's no burden here. This is how it's different than the law. We're constrained by God's love. You know how much work it will take to publish a Bible? Uh, yeah, I guess a, a lot of work, I guess. You know how much work it takes to, to assemble together in the church and to love one another? Yeah, I guess it takes a lot of work. Where does the strength to do that come from? And don't say, because if I don't, God won't let me into heaven. That's not true. God's grace is he's given you heaven, right? So why do you do anything then if you don't have to? Thanksgiving, folks, abounding in thanksgiving to the Lord. Lord, what can I do? Well, you can't do anything to make you who you are, but who you are is who I made you. And hey, there's people over there that need to be made who I want to make them. They need to be saved. They need to come to knowledge of the truth. I'll do this. Right? Thanksgiving. You're doing it out of Thanksgiving. It's a desire you want. So for peace, for stability, it's no longer than does your work affect where you stand. Right? It's not like your work now is affecting you. You're standing, you're stable because you know where you are in Christ because of what he's done. He's finished the work and you're so thankful and you're bound in Thanksgiving that now you can do the work and the work has nothing, no effect on where you stand. Your work can succeed, it can fail, you're still standing there. Okay. Study judgment seat of Christ, right? For joy, 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 9, rejoice in the Lord in all things. Philippians 4, you pray in Thanksgiving because it brings joy. Even the world has figured that out. You're more thankful, you'll be more happy in life. <laughs> Thankful to who? About what? Right? It'll help you with the truth, with purity. Ephesians 5 talks about thanksgiving and purity. Ephesians 5.20 talks about being filled with the Spirit. How do I be filled with the Spirit? You've been given the Spirit. How do you get filled with it? Try thanksgiving. Amen. How do I produce thanksgiving? Remind yourself and acknowledge the things Christ has done for you. Yeah. And the more that gets in you and the more thanksgiving comes out of you, that's what it means. The fruit of the Spirit is love. When you're thankful, love happens naturally. And joy, because when you're thankful, you're joyful. And peace, because when you're thankful that it's been done, you're at peace, folks. It doesn't matter if your prayer against answered or not. Long-suffering, because you're thankful. What am I waiting for? You know, it's long-suffering. Fruit of the Spirit is because of thanksgiving in you. So this is the will of God. And you see that Christians struggle with how to produce the fruit of the Spirit. They struggle with the walk in Christ. They struggle with how to know what to do. They don't know God's will. It's very clearly stated, and when we start to look at it and understand it, we see the importance of knowing it, yeah. right? Any questions or comments?